Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm just going to say a few words. These pictures are so beautiful to see. I wanted to show them to you. Um, I know there's a lot of things to do at the university, so I feel privileged you came here on this beautiful day. I, I always tell my kids, when you choose a place to live, choose a place where you can see the stars at night and close to a university. And uh, that's two of the things we get to have here in southern Illinois. You can live where you can see stars and drive a short distance. Um, I became committed to this area, and I just wanted to say a, a minute about that. I know you all are going to be in the communications fields and maybe get jobs in places all over the country or world even. And it's not a bad way to go to commit yourself to a place. It's also not bad to commit yourself to another person or to some cause, but um, there's a lot going for it, to commit yourself to a place. Uh, you learn a little bit about a place, and you get to the bottom of that, and well then, I started to ask questions about the history of the area I moved to uh, west of Pomona and learned there was a Civilian Conservation Corps camp. Well, I didn't know what that was, so then, you have to learn all about that. You have to learn about the Depression era. You have to then learn about all of Southern Illinois history. And then that leads into natural history. And that leads into geology. And it just goes and goes. So there's a wealth of studying that can be done in any one particular place. Um, this, this program got more interesting to me as time went on. I created this program when I was uh, working at Special Collections Morris Library. Um, a man that worked what was then University Communications, Herb Meyer and I got together and collected all these photographs and I wrote a script. We had a grant from the Illinois Humanities Council, who I wasn't working for then yet, and it was to create a program called Riverwork in Southern Illinois. It had uh, articles were brought in from people all over and I brought a copy of the booklet of articles that we um, collected. I made th this, um, it was a slideshow at the beginning. It was a dissolved two slide projectors slideshow, and then I wrote a series of articles about the history of rivers in southern Illinois and how they made our history what it is. Uh, I did that like in 1988. And if you know anything about technology, very quickly after that, technology changed. And these slide shows that, you know, slide projectors that go dissolve in and out were antiquated. Besides, they were very cumbersome for me to take around. You had to have all this equipment and these sensors that sensed when to. So it, I had the program then put on DVD about in 92, I guess. And in 93, we had a huge flood in southern Illinois. The Mississippi River flooded its banks. Um, the town that was washed away that made all the news in deep southern Illinois was Valmire. That happens to be the town I grew up in. So my parents' house and my grandparents' houses and all my neighbors and relatives' houses were wrecked completely. They moved the town up on the hill. But I began collecting material about that then and decided that the whole program needed an epilogue. So. I started collecting material for that, and Shannon Jones, a radio and TV student here, helped me put this epilogue together. I've never seen the program completely through now with the epilogue, so you as experts in communications, I'd like any comments. We don't have music to the epilogue yet, so that's something we're looking for, some kind of nice music to put. If anybody's got any ideas about any of this, I'd be happy to know them. So. Um, I'll, how, what do I do, Shannon? Press forward, on, on the keyboard? Yeah. See, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> I had a birthday this week, and I was telling Shannon, my 14-year-old son gave me a card that says, um, and this is like a real card you buy in the store. He didn't write this. It says, Mom, I was going to reprogram your phone to play Happy Birthday. And then you open it up and it says, but I knew you'd never be able to change it. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> the 
this land, this is southern Illinois, has had for thousands of years one of the richest and most varied topographies in the world. For eons, rivers from the north, east, and west, draining from the Appalachian to the Rocky Mountains, have met here on their way south, creating between them what was known for most of recorded time. Sorry. <laughs> away from it, it'll just disappear. On the picture? Okay. As the Illinois country. Until two to three million years ago, southern Illinois was buried intermittently under a marine sea, and then carved by freezing waters of four glaciers. Ice mountains larger than Illinois itself split south, their melts slashing river channels through this drainage basin, depositing sediments of silt, sand, and gravel. The third glacier, the Illinoisan, scraped as far south as the 37th latitude, a line which runs today through Harrisburg, Marion, and Carbondale. The land to the south was left as it was, rugged, etched with canyons and valleys, blanketed with a wider diversity of plants than exists in all of Europe, and fed and drained by an intricate network of beautiful rivers. Southern Illinois is evidence that this planet is yet alive, the ground continually transformed by sinkholes and rockfalls. Earthquakes and ice cold springs. Upon this land is flung violent weather, extremes of sweltering heat, and biting cold, sudden thunderstorms, long dry summers, and tornadoes. Its rivers continually adjusting to natural calamities, each river changing the land and being changed by it, cutting through limestone here, digging out caves and overhangs, depositing silt there, for thousands of years, sustaining a lush and fertile place on the earth, creating this land between the rivers. Here, the Ohio River system and the Mississippi River system join Two of the greatest waterways in the world shape this land to resemble the broken tip of a carved spear point, grooved in the interior by their tributaries, the Wabash, the Saline, the Cache, the Big Muddy, and the Okaw. Each a river distinct that continues to form its own give and take with the land through which it moves. Through centuries, these relationships changed, giving and taking away falling here, turning there, creating new pools, waterfalls, and swamps, then abandoning old channels for new, easier paths. And geologists tell of an ancient channel of the Ohio River. Today, this abandoned channel exists as the Cache River Basin used as recently as 1937 as an overflow route, and for centuries sustained as a swamp ecology. Swampland is the natural state of much of the southernmost tip of Illinois. To the south and west of the Shawnee Hills, much of the land was regularly underwater. The Cache and the Big Muddy Basins acted as natural floodways and necessary reservoirs during dry spells. But at times, the rivers had run wild, carrying the runoff from much of the country the river spread out, at once drowning and creating, fertilizing and destroying, a rhythm which only fate can fathom. A dance of gigantic forces and delicate balances, as people know to be the nature of this land. The natives of southern Illinois lived with these forces, seeking their human place within the balances of earth, air, fire, and water, planting their corn in the rich bottomland, settling their camps and cemeteries on higher ground. From river sites such as Modoc Rock Shelter and Randolph County, and carrier mills along the Saline River, archeological evidence shows people living as early as six to 10,000 years ago on a nutritious diet of waterfowl, fish, nuts, deer, and plant foods. Rather than locating along the banks of the treacherous mighty Mississippi, most prehistoric Indians settled along the more stable and less fearsome tributaries. 
about thirteen hundred years ago a distinctive culture of indians emerged which we refer to as mississippians often called the mound builders because of the huge earth mounds they built along the mississippi and ohio river systems these communities chose their river sites very carefully the american bottom and the black bottom were rich places for agriculture and wildlife special plants thrive there as well such as wild cane which requires the most fertile of soils and was used in a wide variety of ways by these natives the river attracted animals and waterfowl and provided easy travel and trade access throughout the continent with dragnets hundreds of fish could be captured in backwater pools crushed hickory nut shells may have been spread to poison the fish which could be easily lifted in woven baskets at places such as fish trap shoals on the big muddy or flat rocks form a natural table saplings were fashioned into weirs behind which fish were trapped mussels were gathered for food and for the shells and pearls half shells were used as spoons and scrapers and cut into ornaments discarded shells were burned and crushed to temper the riverbank clay pottery and the pearls the natives dove for the coveted pearls for the decorations of their pipes and elaborate temples until at least 1200 AD, the Mississippians of Southern Illinois lived in large concentrated agricultural populations, taking in bountiful harvests, working at their subsistence and their arts, traveling and trading by dugouts as far as the Gulf and Rocky Mountains. At Cahokia, their leaders were ingenious enough to build a form of solar observatory and powerful enough to coordinate the construction of this continent's largest earth mound, most of the work probably done by women. Anthropologists have traditionally viewed agricultural work as evidence of human progress requiring complex social and political organization. But the large populations at Cahokia and Kincaid Mounds declined suddenly, probably from living for centuries in too close proximity. Perhaps disease or recurrent flooding caused the many thousands to scatter into smaller groups and to higher locations. Such was the situation in southern Illinois when white explorers came on the scene. From the time American history has been interpreted by white men, they have found it advantageous to portray Native Americans as primitive, savage, and worthless, not any relation to the obviously cultured civilization of the Mississippian mound builders. In the 1870s, one of the most educated and respected men of Southern Illinois, Southern Illinois Normal University President Robert Allen, teacher of psychology and ethics, wrote this of the Aborigines. At most, they were children who despised labor. We used the maize which they sometimes cultured and stupefy ourselves with the smoke of tobacco which they taught us to consume. These are their sole contributions to the world's progress and profit and comfort. Such an idle, unprogressive people should scarcely have a right which an enterprising, ambitious, and needy race should respect. They were selfish and unsocial. Each man for himself they could not combine to grow. They left us nothing. Why remember them? Could they have left a greater gift than this land and all the life it supported? A chance to live on an unscarred continent, riven by pure rivers, that flow by slight reminders of the past caretakers mounds containing a few decorations and sacred objects buried with their dead but no contribution to progress said the white man with the arrival of the white europeans came their progress first the french seeking souls and money then the english struggling to retain dominion over the americans hungry for land french canadian fur traders bartered trinkets for beaver pelts buffalo hides and other skins Fortifications were built as European powers and native tribes fought over trading rights. Fortunes were made and lost in Europe, but the natives only lost their land and their culture. By 1803, there were no more buffalo in Southern Illinois. Few beaver and fewer natives. Within just 100 years, the natural balance of thousands of years was undone by greed, armed with guns and a belief in white supremacy manifest destiny now land was the only prize ownership the reason for work 
Way down upon the Wabash, its lands was never known. If Adam had passed over it, the soil he'd surely own. He'd think it was the garden he'd played in when a boy, and straight pronounce it Eden in the state of Illinois. Eden, the garden, tended with unimaginable respect and understanding of natural forces, worshipped for thousands of years by the natives of this land, but never owned. Only in the last 200 years has that notion prevailed. Until then, white man's work along the rivers closely resembled that of the natives. The French, the English, and the first Americans fished, hunted waterfowl, traded, and protected their river settlements with guns at Fort Massac, Fort Charters, Fort Kaskaskia, and Fort Wilkinsonville. They constructed pirogues, long, narrow dugouts made from cypress or cedar logs, then keelboats propelled by oarsmen, sometimes aided by a sail. These boats were useful for small loads, but large quantities of hides and produce required the construction of flatboats, or bateaux. As early as 1700, convoys of pirogues and bateaux were making regular voyages between the Gulf and the French Indian villages of Kaskaskia and Cahokia. The dangerous and exhausting trip upstream took at least three months. Even the best rowing crews seldom made more than 20 miles a day, rowing from dawn to dusk against a powerful current around shifting sandbanks and dangerous snags, skirting powerful whirlpools. Dense virgin forest reached to the river's edge, its supreme height blocking any breeze for hundreds of mosquito-filled miles. Boats were rowed, punted, or cordelled between the Indian villages, fur trading outposts, eastern towns, and the Gulf. William Morrison, one of the most successful traders of the Illinois country, sent a keelboat each year laden with pelts to Pittsburgh and at least one fat boat to New Orleans loaded with pelts, lead, beef, pork, and tallow. The journey downstream took from 10 to 30 days depending on the river stage. Both the Ohio and the Mississippi were busy with a clumsy raft and flatboat traffic carrying grain and produce from the fertile Illinois country. Originally, Creoles were the predominant professional boatmen but soon American roisterers took the rivers as their own, establishing themselves as national folk heroes who lived rough but independent lives, the way early 19th century Americans liked to see themselves. These boatmen and the Midwestern farmers who depended on the rivers for their livelihoods were among the first Americans to feel the binding effect of our physical geography. Out of our Midwestern river work, threads of a national solidarity were woven bonds that held the nation fast during and after the Civil War. Thousands of Illinois settlers, including Abraham Lincoln as a young man, steered a flatboat of farm goods down past Memphis, Vicksburg, Natchez, to the great city, New Orleans. Their vision of our country thereby given shape and meaning. The trips were dangerous. Through the 18th century, Indians and pirates attacked at notorious places such as the mouth of the Cache, Cave in Rock, and Grand Tower. The human and the geographical river hazards required their careful mapping. In early maps, the riverways were better detailed than the wild interiors whose distances were often grossly misjudged unless a small stream provided access. Along the streams, water mills were constructed the first near Kaskaskia, where the French had been well established and the American merchants first traded. A U.S. land office opened there in 1804 and in Shawneetown in 1814. The American mission of subduing the land began. Now this was work, such hard work that the majority of Southern Illinoisans favored slavery to do the worst of it. Droves of settlers from the east and the southern uplands risked the rapids and snags of the lower Ohio, or came by bumpy wagon overland to cross by ferry into the land between the rivers. Years before land could be purchased in the Illinois country, the James Lusk family came from South Carolina to settle on the Ohio, where in 1798 they built a large tavern house out of used keelboats. James Lusk operated a ferry near present-day Golconda, leaving it to his wife Sarah and her female slave to manage. 
ferries operated for at least 150 years on the Ohio and Mississippi at dozens of crossings. Travelers had the choice to take the difficult overland route westward from Shawneetown or Golconda, or to pull their flatboats from Cairo up the Mississippi. Some built isolated cabins in the frontiers of the present-day counties of Alexander, Union, and Jackson. Others continued north to the more settled regions of Randolph and Monroe counties. In the first decades of the 19th century, lands along the Tamer tributaries were taken up first, often at landings or fords, or at good sites for mills, distilleries, and tanning operations. But the roads crossing southern Illinois from river to river did much to stimulate the settling of the interior. Until the steamboat age, southern Illinois was both a land of promise and the way to somewhere else. In 1811, the steamboat, the New Orleans, visited Cairo, beginning a new era for the populations who worked the rivers and for the rivers themselves. In 1815, the captain of the Mississippi, Henry M. Shreve, designed the prototype of the shallow hull version of the steamboat. By 1831, hundreds of these noisy paddle and stern wheelers were plying the western rivers. Probably no other invention heralded such great and paradoxical changes for Southern Illinois as the steamboat. Its river towns with good harbors boomed, but no longer did the westward migration cross the Southern Illinois interior from Shawneetown. Now steam power could take settlers by river around Southern Illinois to St. Louis, the new gateway to the west. In a single generation, freight rates from New Orleans to St. Louis were reduced from $1,000 a ton to $40. Such a trip could now be made in four days, as the famed river captain Isaiah Sellers did in 1844. Steamboat river pilots became the new popular idols who commanded incredible salaries. Many of them had learned their trade as keelboatmen, retaining skill and a near mystical understanding of the ever-changing weather and river signs. Steamboats burned wood and required a lot of it as did the new settlements which grew from the landings all along southern Illinois shores during the 1840s and 1850s. At Marshall's Landing, Shawneetown, Elizabethtown, Golconda, Caledonia, Trinity, Cairo, Hamburg, Fayville, Sparhawk's Landing, Willard's Landing, Jenkins Landing, Rockwood, Chester, and Harrisonville, boats took on cords of wood and eventually tons of coal for their insatiable boilers. Within a generation, the vast virgin forests along the riverbanks were cut down, causing severe erosion and floodings until levees were built. Those interior settlements along the tributaries became feeders to the booming industries and marketplaces of the more uproarious river towns. As early as 1810, coal was loaded into flatboats on the Big Muddy and exported to New Orleans. Later, the coal was carried on rail from Mount Carbon to the waiting barges of the Grand Tower Mining, Manufacturing, and Transportation Company. Sawmills established throughout southern Illinois sent cordwood, valuable logs, and cut timber to the riverbanks. Great rafts of logs were floated downstream, and roustabouts loaded steamboats with farm produce, grain, cotton, potatoes, meat, and fruit. Entrepreneurs and scattered families of settlers bought the best of the forested land. But during the steamboat era, Southern Illinois' interior was in a sense left high and dry, defined by its rivers, and now deserted because of its rivers. Southern Illinois historian John Allen explained how it happened. You see, the two channels are the two currents of migration, one coming in over the National Road and the other by the rivers, bypass Southern Illinois. And I term it an historical eddy. It was left there to, in its own stew and its own juices or whatever you want to call it. Mainstream progress rushed past southern Illinois, stopping to refuel at her thriving river towns, to bring in new immigrants, to carry away their harvests. But all under the looming clouds of impending tragedy, the Civil War. By 1861, Southern Illinois found itself painfully wedged deep between rebelling states of the South, separated only by narrow bands of water. 
Cairo, strategically located, became General Grant's headquarters. The mighty town was soon overloaded with outgoing soldiers and eventually incoming wounded. Blacks crowded into refugee camps. The Mississippi River had become a battlefield. Steamboats were used as troop and supply transports, and even as hospitals. At Mound City, a flotilla of ironclad fighting ships was built under the direction of James B. Eads. Late in April 1862, Union boats possessed New Orleans and claimed the Mississippi. Much of the credit for the Union's Western victories is given to Eads, a man of two life-abiding passions, engineering and the Mississippi. Earlier in his life, he had salvaged hundreds of sunken steamboats and barge cargoes, and in 1874, he engineered the bridge across the Mississippi, which bears his name. This bridge, which connected St. Louis by rail to other major cities, marked the end of the short-lived but glorious steamboat era. Now railroads ruled, and the rivers of southern Illinois were obstacles to their movement and progress. Trains had to be dismantled and hauled across the rivers by ferry from Chester, Thebes, Metropolis, and Cairo. Eventually, railroad bridges connected Illinois to her neighboring states. And within a few decades, highway bridges made ferry work nearly obsolete. Sawmills had been active along the rivers and streams for decades. Lumbering was the most important means of livelihood in those interior regions accessible by water. James Bell had the largest sawmill in southern Illinois, located on the Cache, near Allen. Bell Lumber Company shipped millions of feet of virgin cypress to their mill pond and then down the Mississippi. Succeeding Bell in 1898 was the Main Brothers Mill and Box Factory. The Main Brothers Enterprise is the most notable example of early lumbering dependent on the rivers. Employing two to three hundred workers and eventually owning nearly 25,000 acres of Cache River bottomland, the company cut an extensive network of ditches in the Black Slough area to facilitate drainage and log floats. A large crew of employees annually cleared the banks and snagged the channels. Logs were piled along the riverbanks to be rolled in when the water was high and the current just right. A boom across the upper end of Post Creek stopped the logs, diverting them into the sawmill pond. It was not until after World War II that logs were moved by truck. Prior to then, the logs that weren't floated were hauled by oxen, normally one at a time if they were of the usual immense dimensions. At the turn of the century, along the interior rivers of southern Illinois, sawmills were processing hundreds of millions of board feet of timber, sawed lumber, veneer for baskets and boxes, barrel staves and railroad cross ties, mine timbers, pilings, and charcoal. Although some timber cutters were not far-sighted, the Main Brothers selectively cut and maintained good stands that continued to produce high-grade lumber. In fact, according to Max Hutchison of the Natural Land Institute, the forests of the Cache River Basin were not decimated by the lumbering industry, but by the agricultural industry's drainage programs. From the time of the earliest settlement, there were men who expended much of their lives promoting their view of progress for Southern Illinois. They envisioned a potentially great agricultural and residential area where only one thing was needed, drainage. Drainage commissions were formed throughout Southern Illinois. Granted the power in 1903 to dredge, dam, and tax, the drainage commission of the Cache River worked with the zeal of any manifest destiny promoter to subdue the land, turn wetlands into productive fields, channelize the rivers so greater loads could be hauled, and replace the sparsely populated bottomland forest with rows of corn stalks and neat farmhouses. Most loggers opposed drainage, but the farmers gradually gained the majority with arguments for multiplying agricultural production and stopping the spread of malaria, the scourge of the swamplands. In the Cache River Basin, the progressive solution proposed was the Post Creek Cutoff, an engineering marvel of its day designed to drain the upper Cache Basin into the Ohio River. When it was completed in 1916, no one could envision the environmental problems it would cause in the decades hence. Cutting an outlet to the Ohio drastically increased the velocity of the water. The dynamics of the Cache and its tributaries have been gravely altered. The concentrated water flow increased the runoff, which deepened the channels, 
causing severe erosion along the stream banks. The Post Creek cutoff sliced an awesomely deep gorge, which required its tributaries to downcut to reach the same base level. Straight ditches were cut to eliminate the natural bends and curves. Levees were built by the Illinois Division of Waterways and the Army Corps of Engineers. As a result, thousands of acres of Cache River bottomland were brought under cultivation in the 1940s and 50s, which eventually caused severe erosion and muddy streams, a decline in the timber industry, and a profound loss of swampland habitat for hundreds of species of animals, plants, and birds. Once, waters that entered the upper cache from the Fern Cliff area took a long, winding, leisurely course for several days before reaching the Ohio. Today, the water rushes to the Ohio in a matter of hours. As the water course was shortened, the gradient steepened. Deeper channels upset the bank stability that had developed over the centuries. Today, when the Ohio is high, water backs up into the Post Creek Ditch and the Cache River system, flooding the fields which have rarely produced crops. The creeks and swamp areas remaining in the basin have become more silt laden, able to hold less water. So ironically, flood levels are higher now than they naturally were prior to the drainage efforts. And in periods of dry weather, farmers rush to increase their crop acreage by clearing more swampland. But then there are fewer swamplands to hold flood water and provide a constant steady flow in the streams and rivers. The simple fact is that much of the land in the southern tip of southern Illinois is a natural wetland a complicated ecology that developed over a millennium. When man tried to solve a problem by changing a river's course, he created other, perhaps more severe problems, upstream and down. In the name of progress, man dramatically changed the nature of Southern Illinois rivers as his uses of them changed. First, their banks were denuded of trees to fuel the steamboats. Consequent erosion and flooding required levees to be built ever higher to protect the settlements some of which grew into thriving towns. Between 1870 and 1920, a southern Illinois river town was where the action was. Packet boats made regular trips between towns such as Evansville, Golconda, and Cairo, or Thebes, Chester, and St. Louis. Some of these boats were made of local lumber at Mound City or Metropolis. Many were owned by successful men and women of southern Illinois who may have captained the craft and hired their families and neighbors as crew. The life and prosperity of these towns depended on the rivers. A vital subculture of fisher folk had been emerging for over a century along the rivers. Families fished and collected mussels. Fish was traditionally a primary food for the early Illinois settlers, who by winter's end were often close to starvation. The waters of the Cache, Okaw, Wabash, and Big Muddy became lucrative fishing and hunting areas. Thousands of fisher folk lived a nomadic houseboat life, working seasonally at the sawmills and on the river. Salted fish were shipped by the barrel and mussel shells sold by the ton to the McKee Button Factory in Metropolis, where button discs were punched out of each half. Sometimes the discovered pearl boosted the family's yearly income. During the 1800s, the rivers provided a subsistence for many, some of them transients who could depend at least on a small river harvested meal. At the turn of the century, rivers could still supply the bare necessities, food, water, and a small cash income. The rivers remained the primary means of travel and communication. Packet boats hauled out the farm produce, brought in the tradesmen and their wares, carried passengers, mail, and news of coming attractions. Show boats, elaborately decorated vessels, visited the major river towns on a regular schedule. The calliope is heard a mile before their anticipated arrival. Smaller vessels catered to the local crowds, carrying a community party to a picnic or an evening of dancing or gambling. A packet boat could be hailed to deliver a man to his dentist in Paducah or a woman to her St. Louis relatives. Until the railroads completely usurped the rivers as corridors of commerce, southern Illinois river towns were lively stopping places for a country on the move. Through the 1940s, the rivers continued to be important outlets, at least for the bulky raw materials wrenched from the region's interior. But the large tows of limestone, lumber, and coal grew even more massive, requiring constant dredging and lock and dam improvements by the Army Corps of Engineers. By the 1950s, the role of rivers in the nation's progress was to move awesome tonnage, 
pushed by conglomerate towing companies devoid of any particular interest in the welfare of southern Illinois. The fishing industry drastically declined as the locked and dammed rivers became, in the words of one Ohio River fisherman, like a row of so many lukewarm bathtubs. In the age of movie theaters and television, showboats became quaint curiosities, a few permanently docked. Upstream, great industries of so-called progress have been using the rivers as sewers, contaminating the water and the fish to such degree to be recently declared completely unsafe for human consumption. The Kaskaskia, the Cache, and the Big Muddy, all once quiet, verdant, winding rivers, have now been dammed, straightened, dredged, and riprapped to create lakes and accommodate coal and grain barges. According to Max Hutchison, Illinois conservationist and a champion of the remaining scraps of natural land in southern Illinois, we would not recognize the past rivers as the same ones we see today. So much has been changed. Gone, probably forever, is the natural river. A world of wonder, learning, and recreation. The riverbanks today are seen by most southern Illinoisans as unhealthy places where one can watch barges go by. People such as Mr. Hutchison are seriously questioning the trade-offs, the paradox of progress in Southern Illinois. If we define progress as an improvement, an advancement toward perfection, I'm afraid that a lot of what we have done to our rivers cannot be called that. I guess that the real question is, who and what are we living for? Do we think only of ourselves, or do we consider our children and grandchildren? Are we living only for the immediate rewards of the present, or do we consider present sacrifices worthwhile to make a better world for the next generation? We in Southern Illinois try so hard to make a living and collect more material goods to pass on to our children, assuming that it's things that will make life easier for them. The cost of much of what we are buying today may be more than it is worth. The cost of our progress has not been immediately apparent, or we surely would not have spent all we have. It is true that riverwork progress has helped to bring this generation more material products than any earlier generation could have imagined possible. And we now have the ability to move immense barges. We have some tentative assurance against the recurrent flooding of major towns and we have more drained agricultural lands. For this progress, what have we paid? The cost is not measurable in dollars, but includes thousands of acres of timberland, swampland, and river habitat for wildlife. The nesting and breeding grounds along the Mississippi Flyway have been scalped. We have lost millions of tons of invaluable topsoil. And we have lost all of our sources for pure drinking water, a priceless resource which is now permanently contaminated for future generations. Lost as well are old and independent ways of living in southern Illinois, a rich, full river town tradition. Those towns that once thrived on river work are today merely hoping to base their river-related economies on nostalgia and tourism a pale substitute for genuine river work. Did we have choices in the uses of our rivers? Of course. And we must admit to being short-sighted and committing grievous mistakes. Perhaps it is not too late to change our priorities and at least stop damaging our rivers. But it is clear that we must act immediately if the next generation is to have any choice at all in their relationship to our rivers and this land. Since the initial creation in 1987 of this examination of Southern Illinois river work history, important events have transpired on our rivers. The public interest and concern about the uses and abuses of our waterways has continued, so an epilogue seems appropriate that highlights some of the events of the last 20 years. Since the early 90s, a sad new version of a riverboat tradition, gambling, has set itself up in fancy state-sanctioned boats. 
first tethered in Metropolis to a legal loophole, and eventually on shore in East St. Louis. River casinos are now touted as successes for the tourism industry and local economies. In the interior of Southern Illinois, the Cache River State Natural Area has become a huge success for both recreation and the region's natural ecology. The Cache River Wetlands Joint Venture Partnership has continued working through the last 30 years to protect and restore a 60,000 acre wetland corridor along 50 miles of the Cache River. The area is nationally significant as it contains true southern swamps at their northern tier of their range allowing for rare biological diversity. The natural area protects 11 state champion trees and 100 threatened and endangered species, making it one of the most important wetlands in the country. The recently opened Henry Barkhausen Wetland Center features wildlife viewing platforms, canoe and hiking trails, and exhibit displays explaining the ecology and history of the Cache River Valley. A whole host of individuals, landowners, citizen groups, and agencies cooperate to repair natural ecosystems. They hope to preserve and expand these last remnants of a unique natural resource so it can be understood and used appropriately for recreation and education. An example of what just one dedicated person can do is the work of Chad Pogracki, who grew up along the Mississippi working as a commercial fisherman and shell diver. Greatly bothered by the amount of garbage along the banks, he began cleaning it up. In 1997, he single-handedly cleaned 100 miles of the Mississippi shoreline. With community donations and a grant from Alcoa, he expanded the next year to 435 miles, removing over 400,000 pounds of trash north of St. Louis. In 1999, he took on the cleanup of the Illinois River, and in 2000, he was back on the Mississippi. In 2001, he initiated the Ohio River Beautification and Restoration Project. He was given a barge by the Marquette Barge Company in Paducah, which he turned into an educational center. In 2002, Chad's organization, Living Lands and Waters, spread its work to the rivers in seven Midwestern states, organized river cleanups with 3,000 volunteers, bringing their total trash removed to 800 tons. In 2002, Chad was invited to attend the World Summit on Sustainable Environment in South Africa and received the Jefferson Award, America's version of the Nobel Prize for Public Service. The good work of Chad and crew continues. The river event that directly affected millions of people, the 1993 flood, calls us to question our management of the Mississippi and what progress has been achieved. The American Bottom, the Mississippi Valley just south of St. Louis, was used to control flooding since the early 19th century. During the flood of 1844, steamboats glided from bluff to bluff. There were bad floods in the 1860s, again in 1879 and through the 1880s. In 1879, Congress created the Mississippi River Commission with a levees-only flood control policy. The river would be totally contained. In 1926, the Army Corps said the Mississippi Valley would never flood again. 1927 saw the largest flood in history, 27,000 square miles underwater. Thousands of people died. There were severe floods in the 1940s, but the Corps' solution was to build the levees even higher. Wetland was a bad word to a farmer, land yet to be drained. In the Mississippi Valley, the 1950s and 1960s were, as John McPhee wrote, the secure decades, the lucky decades when floods did not threaten. In this time, a whole generation grew up, believing their farms were now forever safe from flooding. Extreme high water in 1973 pushed the levees only system to its limit but they held, thereby fortifying the belief in levees only flood control. The Corps said with pride of the Mississippi, we harnessed it, straightened it, regularized it, shackled it. 
Over the last decades of the 20th century, the river's driving economic requirement, its purpose for being, became fixed. It was the means to move Midwest grain to international markets. Then in the summer of 1993, rainfall in the upper Midwest exceeded 150% of normal amounts. The Mississippi kept rising through July, its waters lapping at the tops of the levees, until finally the farmers and towns below St. Louis were evacuated. Still, most officials weren't really worried. It hadn't flooded since 1947. The levees would hold. On August 1, 1993, in spite of thousands of sandbaggers, the Mississippi topped the Columbia levee and went roaring on into the town of Valmire covering the towns and farms with 6 to 15 feet of water. In all, 20 million acres were affected in nine states. The 93 flood caused 52 deaths and left 74,000 homeless. Valmire eventually relocated up onto the bluff above the valley. The owner of one farm in the American Bottom, who lost his house and buildings, said of the river, she reclaimed her valley. Questioning progress in terms of river work leads to the inevitable questions, whose progress and at whose expense? Who is the Mississippi River for? What purposes should it serve? A gift from creation, who can pollute it? Who should clean it up? Who gets to decide? John McPhee wrote, that when you start asking what a river is for, you end up wondering what anything is for. And in this competition for the use of our rivers, who will speak for the mussels, for the fish, for the plants and the nesting birds? Who will argue for the right to pure river drinking water? A St. Louis poet, T.S. Eliot, wrote this of the Mississippi. I do not know much about gods, but I think that the river is a strong brown god, sullen, untamed, and intractable, patient to some degree, at first recognized as a frontier, useful, untrustworthy, as a conveyor of commerce, then only as a problem confronting the builder of bridges. The problem once solved, the brown god is almost forgotten by the dwellers in cities, ever, however, implacable, keeping his seasons and rages destroyer, reminder of what men choose to forget.